Okay, uh, let's start. So, uh, welcome everybody to Research at TTIC. Uh, for those of you who uh, are not here every week, uh, we do have uh, these talks every week, uh, um, uh, featuring different faculty members, uh, telling them about, uh, telling us a bit about the research, uh, both some uh, latest excitement and uh, perhaps more, uh, uh, more broadly, uh, the research interests and uh, overall excitement about uh, uh, research areas. Uh, today, we're uh, uh, very happy to have Karen Levesco, who's uh, a long-term faculty here at uh, TTI, uh, working on uh, speech technologies. But today, she'll actually, from what I understand, uh, tell us not just about uh, um, speech and uh, uh, speech encoding text, but what? Don't give it away. I'm not supposed to. We'll only be talking to us about speech. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Karen. Okay, sure. Okay, so I have to apologize for two things. Um, one is for anybody who saw the original version of the title of this talk and is expecting that talk, I apologize. It's not that talk. It's a, uh, it includes some of that material that, that was suggested by that title, but also some other stuff because I realized they, that we have our newly admitted students here and I thought it would be nice to have kind of a broader talk covering a couple different topics. Um, and then if I get to the end of the talk and I haven't apologized for anything else, let me know. I'll tell you what, what I should have apologized for. Okay, so this talk is about language beyond text. Um, we've been hearing a lot about text um, around here, and probably all of you, wherever you are, uh, have also been hearing a lot about text. Um, and that is what this talk is not about. Um, it is about language, but it's not about text. Does everybody know? what um, this is an example of? It's a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but it is chat GPT. Um, I do want to point out that it correctly um, noticed that we have a highly selective admissions process um, and are recognized as one of the leading computer science research institutes in the world. So at least it's accurate on some things. OK, but um, this talk is not about this. Um, this talk is about language that is not text. Um, and so one kind of language that's not text is speech. So I'm going to play um, an example of speech. Um, and this is the other thing I wanted to apologize for is anybody who's heard, this, heard me play this example before. I'm sorry about that. I just really like this example. Um, let me tell you what you're looking at here. Um, this is a waveform uh, recording of the speech, so just uh, pressure at a microphone versus time. Um, and then above that is a spectrogram, so it's a time frequency representation, frequency on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, and darkness indicating how much of each frequency is at each time. Uh, yeah. A silly yeah. question about sure. speech recognition. Uh, is the second plot uh, symmetrical, or if it's so, why? So, no. It looks almost symmetrical. Symmetrical about oh, what the axis? axis. Uh, the x axis. About zero. Yeah. About Positive and negative. Yeah. This one? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's going to be almost symmetric because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, just, it's, it's a sum of a bunch of sinusoidal components. <laughs> Much of it is. Um, so a lot of it will be almost symmetrical. So if. Okay, almost. That's interesting because if it is symmetrical, then it seems redundant to show it the full. Uh, yes, uh, and so rectified speech, where you chop off half of it, um, it contains much the same information. Okay, so let's move on. Um, but feel free to stop me at any time. Um, okay, so let's play this example. Um, all right, so hopefully, um, as you're listening to um, this example of speech, you're noticing that there are some things in it besides the corresponding text. Um, so, oops. 
You can apologize now. <laughs> I'm not apologizing. <laughs> if I apologize again, I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, so what do we perceive in this signal that we just listened to? Um, so, of course, we perceive a sequence of words, um, which would be the corresponding text if we were to transcribe the signal. Um, but we also notice a bunch of other things. Um, properties of the speakers, we can take a guess at their age, at their dialect, their geographic uh, accent, um, their identity, if we know these speakers. Um, we probably notice there's some laughter, there's some background noise. Um, if you listen very carefully, you'll notice there's some pronunciation variation. So the same words are pronounced different ways um, by different speakers or even by the same speaker, just in different contexts. Um, you might have noticed differences in prosody. Um, so prosody refers to changes in pitch and volume and timing, and that's what made the two versions of Got the Keys different. Um, and that's a meaning-bearing component in speech that doesn't exist in text. Um, and you might have noticed some markers of emotion in, in, in this conversation. Um, and, um, and meaning, um, which is kind of a combination of many of those things put together. Okay. Um, so, how is speech different from text? Well, um, it has many of the things that we just talked about, um, but also it just has different distributions of word sequences. Um, so if you were to build a language model over sequences of words uh, that are spoken, that are spontaneously spoken, the distribution of those words would look different from the distribution of naturally written text. Um, then there's all the other additional dimensions that we talked about, speaker, acoustic channel, all of those things. Um, some aspects of meaning are carried by prosody, whereas if you were to write the text and try to convey the same meaning, you might need to convey it in some other way, perhaps with extra words or with punctuation, or maybe some of that would just get lost in translation between speech and text. Um, okay, um, another kind of non-text language is sign language, um, and here's an example of that. Does anyone here know a sign language? Just curious. Okay, no. okay. We'll, we'll talk about sign language. Um, okay, so, so far we've talked about three modalities of language, written, spoken, and signed. Um, and if you look at um, languages around the world, um, they tend to have different modalities that, they're, that uh, they naturally appear in. So for example, English can be written or spoken. Um, Mandarin Chinese can be written or spoken. Um, modern Standard Arabic is written. It can be spoken, but it's not used for you know day-to-day -day conversation. Um, Lebanese Arabic is spoken, but doesn't have a standard written form. Nadi has a question. I'm just curious, because you made this decision from uh, modern Standard Arabic. So when you say spoken, do you mean Necessarily like conversational, or like if I read that, it, no, I mean, like, uh, you know, uh, it, it does have a, a spoken or... form, it gets used on the news and so on. Um, but it's not a, a spoken form that you and I would use if we're speaking to each other and we knew modern standard. Right, so I'm just wondering, in, in, in this context of this talk, when you say spoken, do you mean exclusively to like the I'm, natural? I'm being very hand wavy about okay. it. <laughs> That's why I put the question mark there because it depends on how you interpret that term. Um, and then there are sign languages that are signed, but neither spoken nor written. So sign languages don't have, uh, no sign language has a standard written form. Um, and then if you were to look at the total number of uh, different kinds of languages in the world, you'd see that there's about 7,000 spoken languages, just if you were to just total all of these columns, um, of which about 3,700 have a written form, so slightly over half. Um, and then two, three, maybe a little more hundred signed languages that don't have a, a corresponding spoken or written form. Okay. Karen, quick question about sign yeah. language. Why do different countries need to have different sign language? Like you don't need to tie that to your mother language, basically. Why do different countries need to have different spoken languages? Yeah, so here, Korean and America have different. I'm, I'm asking you. Oh, I'm, Why do different uh, countries need to have different like spoken a, languages? In, in a, I think there's one. That's enough. 
That's right. And people have tried to design um, one spoken language that we can all use around the world, like Esperanto, and have failed. Um, and people so have tried to do that with reason. sign language as well. But um, languages are things that, um, that develop um, organically within a community. Um, and people tend to not like having different languages forced on them. Well, I mean, that's not true for all these languages. I mean, so actually, I'm curious. So is sign language developed organically? Absolutely. So, so the different sign languages developed organically separately? Absolutely. I mean, not all these languages. I mean, again, modern standard Arabic is not, is not exactly developed yeah. organically. Yeah, 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 so many countries have a language, uh, what's it called, the language academy? Mm -hmm. Um, which dictates certain aspects, tries to dictate with, with different degrees of success, different aspects of the language. Yes. Where would you place Braille? Is the form of, I guess, a variant of written? Braille language? is a written form of a language. That's the same language. I mean, it just uses different font, basically. Or... Okay, now you're really testing my limits. <laughs> <laughs> my understanding was that there are different, you know, there's a Braille for each alphabet. Um, and so any language that uses that alphabet would use the corresponding Braille. All right, enough of that. <laughs> um, OK, so, so that's all about modalities of language. How, does, how do these affect language research? Um, so for spoken language, the main line of attack for the last, I would say, about 50 years, as long as, as you know, active spoken language research has existed, um, the main line of attack has been to convert, try to convert spoken language to text using automatic speech recognition, um, and then hand that text over to an NLP person to do text processing on it, to do all sorts of higher level understanding tasks like translation or co-reference resolution or parsing or whatever we might want to do with higher level um, understanding. Um, if there's no written form, then that step one is a little problematic, so we tend to invent one. Um, and this really only works well if we have enough transcribed speech data that we can train a high quality speech recognizer. Okay. Um, for sign language, the main line of attack for the last 50 years has been basically to avoid sign language um, and not do any research on it because it's extremely difficult. Um, but that is changing um, in the last. Uh, it's been slowly changing over time, and I think now it's kind of accelerating, and there's a good chunk of people that use sign language. Okay. Um, so this talk will be divided into two parts, one about sign, spoken language and one about sign language. Um, I kind of mushed two talks together. Hopefully we get to everything, um, but still feel free to stop me with questions. Okay. Um, so what I want to talk about is just kind of the state of these research areas, spoken language research and sign language research, and just a little bit about what um, my group has been involved with, um, just a couple of lines of work related to each of these. Um, so we've talked about kind of this main uh, paradigm of research on spoken language. Um, and this approach really depends on our ability to build um, high quality speech recognition systems. And this is a reasonable assumption um, for some languages or some domains where we have lots of training data, but maybe not for others where we have a lot less. So if you remember, there's 7,000 languages in the world. We don't have equal amounts of, of training data available for all of those languages. Okay, um, so what is the state of the art in spoken language research? Um, I'd say there are two approaches that are uh, kind of popular right now. One is to train a speech recognizer on all of the transcribed speech that you can find, um, which OpenAI has done recently. It's called Whisper. You might have seen it in the news. Um, they basically found close to 700,000 hours of speech in about 100 languages. Um, and their model looks something like this. I won't go through the details, but it's a, um, an encoder that encodes the speech um, into some representation, and then an attention-enabled decoder. Um, so it's a very kind of basic-looking encoder-decoder model, which if you've seen models for machine translation or other language tasks, it looks very similar. There are some kind of interesting details to it that I, I won't get into. Um, but for the most part, it's just relying on this vast amount of training data. OK. Um, so how does this model do? Um, yes. 
the title said weak supervision, but you told us it's trained based on transcriptions, so that seems like very smart. Yeah. Curious, what, it's, uh, why do they say it's weak supervision? It's weak supervision because those transcriptions are pretty noisy. So they're just scraping the web. And so sometimes the text that goes along with a spoken utterance is you know, some description of the corresponding video and doesn't have anything to do with it. Um, they went to some trouble to try to clean it up, but not too much trouble. Okay. Okay, so how does it do? Um, so I won't show you a whole bunch of numbers. Um, it gets overall really impressive performance in the sense that um, it can do reasonably well on a bunch of different domains, whereas most speech recognizers are trained on one language and one domain and really fail miserably when they switch to another one. Um, so the overall average performance is quite impressive, but if you look across languages, um, it's still doing very badly for the lower resource languages. So what you're seeing here is um, one dot for every language, so every language has a code, this is Mandarin Chinese, this is French, this is English, this is Spanish, and so on. Um, and for each language we have the number of hours of transcribed speech and the corresponding word error rate, so lower is better. Um, this is the proportion of the ground truth words that the recognizer got wrong. Um, for, for new speech in that language. So as you can see, um, it degrades very badly um, for, uh, for languages for which we don't have a lot of data. Um, and it wasn't too long ago that 100 hours of speech was considered like a respectable amount of data. <laughs> so, yeah. What are the units on the word error rate? Is that percent. Percent. Yes. Percent. Yes. So <laughs> the word error rate <laughs> is the number of substitutions plus number of deletions plus number of insertions divided by the number of words in the ground truth. So if you hypothesize more words than are in the ground truth, you could have more than 100%. Wait, wait, wait. So that means for those languages, that, that means the output of text is on average more than twice the length of the real text? That seems um, a bit crazy. No, not necessarily. Do. If you get everything wrong... It's only 100%. And then also add some words. You have to be 100. That means you have to be more than one and a half times longer. For one sixty. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you can find like one deletions and insertions. Yeah, maybe three inches <coughs> plus insertions. And if you get everything right, it's two hundred percent. Right. You can't use substitution. Yeah, no, I mean without, it's maybe. Yeah, but what they've been saying maybe numbers without. Anyway, it's a log scale, so you can't quite tell how high. I mean, it's something. Oh, it's something that's true. Between, that's true. That's true. It might just get to about hundred. It is something between eighty and one hundred and sixty. Yeah, that's true. Um, but there's something right up here, right? Um, anyway, it's bad. Um, I move on, or just <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So that's that's one option. Just get all the transcribed data that you can get. Train a speech recognizer. Another option, um, which I would say is more popular. Um, is to get all of the unlabeled speech data that you can get and train a self-supervised uh, speech representation model on all of that data, and then fine tune that model on a very limited amount of data that you have for whatever language or domain of interest. Uh, okay. Um, and so I'll say a little bit more about this later, but by self-supervised, we mean that we're going to take unlabeled data and then devise a task that we're going to call a pretext task um, from just the unlabeled data for the model to solve. And we'll try to design that task so that a model that solves the task is hopefully learning something useful about the signal. Okay. Um, so um, I would say the first big success um, using this approach came in 2020 with a model called wave to vec 2.0. This was a self-supervised model that was used to improve the performance and the data efficiency of the speech recognizer on a very popular benchmark called LibreSpeech. Um, so um, what you're seeing here is on the x-axis um, the amount of labeled speech data and on the y-axis word error rate again, also in percent. Um, and then the dark blue bars are, um, are the performance of a supervised automatic speech recognizer trained on that data set. And then the light bars 
oops, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's the light bars that are the supervised model. And the dark bars um, are the same model, but initialized from a pre-trained wave to vec 2.0 self-supervised model. Okay. Um, so what you can see is that um, a model that's pre-trained with wave to vec um, outperforms a supervised model using less than using just 1% of the data. So one one hundredth of the data, one hour versus 100 hours. Um, so that's a huge savings in data efficiency. Um, also, if you use the full training set, which in this case is 960 hours, you still get a little bit of a boost from, the, uh, from using the pre-trained model. Okay. Um, so since that time, there have been a whole bunch more self-supervised uh, speech representation models proposed. Um, and they all follow the same sort of template where we start with a whole bunch of unlabeled, typically raw speech, but occasionally uh, spectrograms. Um, and then we design some pretext task that we think if the model solves it, it should learn something useful about speech. Um, and so the tasks might be something like masking out portions of the audio or portions um, or some, some set of frequencies um, and then having the model try to reconstruct them. Um, another possibility is, again, to mask out um, segments of speech and time, but to learn some encoding, some low-level encoding of speech, and that is what we try to uh, reconstruct rather than the speech itself. Um, and these sorts of models are sort of BERT-like, if you're familiar with the BERT model for text. And so some of them are also called BERT-like things, like Hubert. Um, and I would say most of the popular self-supervised models these days are in this category. Okay. Um, so this is just a few types of self-supervised models. There's now kind of a zoo of, of self-supervised speech models. Um, so much so that a, a leaderboard has been designed. It's called the Superb Leaderboard um, that has a bunch of benchmark tasks like uh, speech recognition, spoken term detection, intent classification, uh, things like that. Um, and then it's basically a big bake-off among all of these uh, pre-trained self-supervised models. And there's a much, much longer list. This is just the top of the leaderboard. Um, and the way that, don't bother staring at the numbers, they're not important. Um, just wanted to impress you with the large number of them. Um, and the, um, and the way that the models are compared quickly on all of these tasks is that for each model, a predictor is learned, which is just a weighted sum of the layers of the pre-trained model passed through a linear classifier. Or, well, for some tasks linear, or for other tasks, some other simple model. Um, OK. Um, so that's, that's one way to compare. <laughs> Uh, self-supervised models, but it's not a very, um, I think, insightful way or interpretable way, and it doesn't give us guidance for, for what to do with ourselves once we get these numbers. Um, so one thing that um, some that, that uh, I've been working on with some people in my group, um, led largely by Akita, who's sitting somewhere in this room, back in the back of the room, is to try to um, analyze a in a little bit more detail what these self-supervised models know by some definition of um, I think Juche is also somewhere here in this room, maybe not, probably best for him, he's seen all of this. And then Bowen um, is a student who has almost graduated and is already at Meta. Okay. Um, all right, so our goal here is to get, gain a better understanding of self-supervised speech representation. So what do we know so far? Um, we know that these models improve performance and reduce labeling needs um, for many speech tasks. We know that any state-of-the-art approach for any speech task these days uses one of these models. Um, but we also know that adapting a model to a task that we're interested in takes some trial and error, like choosing the best model for the task, deciding how to fine-tune it. This, this weighted combination of layers is one way, but there are many, many ways to fine-tune. Um, and we also have very little guidance for how to design pretext tasks to get a model that behaves in a certain way that we would like. Um, so we'd like to fix all of that. And as a start, we'd like to know what kind of linguistic information is encoded in the model and in each layer of the model. 
Um, we'd also like to know how the choice of pretext task affects that information. Um, how does the model change when we fine tune it? Um, maybe that suggests better ways to fine tune the model. Um, and can we do all of this analysis in some lightweight way that doesn't involve training a whole bunch of models for a whole bunch of downstream tasks? Okay, so that's the goal. Um, and I'll show you just a sampling of what we've done, a sampling of the results, but you can refer to the papers for, for more. Um, so we're going to do a layer-wise analysis, and most of these models have a pretty similar structure. Um, they start with a speech signal um, that has some corresponding uh, transcription, which I can write either in terms of words or in terms of a phoneme sequence. And then that signal is passed typically through some number of convolutional layers, and then some number of transformer layers, which for many models is either 12 or 24. Okay. Um, so the first thing we'll do is we'll um, extract um, representations from each layer. And then to measure the, um, the information content in each layer, is we'll, we'll measure their similarity to some external linguistic variable that we care about. Um, so what representations will we extract? Um, we'll extract frame level representations, which means for every short snippet of, say, 10 milliseconds, um, we have a vector for every layer L and every time frame T. Um, we'll also extract uh, representations over phone size segments. So we'll take uh, a phone or a phoneme, those are roughly synonymous, um, and we'll average um, over frames in that phoneme. Or we can pool over an entire word. We'll take all of the frames in a word and average over that. Okay. Um, and then we'd like to compare that to some external variable like words or phones or something like that. Um, and the way we'll do that comparison is using canonical correlation analysis. Um, this is a, a classic statistical technique, not something that we invented. Um, it's a way of defining a similarity between a pair of random vectors. So let's say I have a pair of random vectors x and y. Um, I'm going to define a similarity between them in terms of correlations between projections of those uh, random vectors. Okay. Um, and it's been previously used to analyze other kinds of models, like text models, and to compare speech models to each other. Um, and we're going to use it to measure similarity between the layers and some external variable. Um, okay, so just to be concrete, um, I'll define CCA. Um, so we're going, to, we're going to compute a set of correlations for different projections of these vectors. So the first one, row one, will be the maximal correlation between any um, pair of projections of the two vectors, on the two vector variables onto some vector A1, B1. Um, and then subsequent correlations will maximize the same quantity um, subject to um, Sub subsequent projections being uncorrelated with each other. Okay. Um, and then we'll define a final score as an average correlation over all of these projections. Um, in fact, we'll do something a little bit more complicated called projection weighted CCA, which weights these correlations by some coefficients. Um, but if you'll allow me to just <laughs> skip that detail, um, we can uh, we can think of it as, as, as CCA, and in the end we'll get a number which is uh, an average correlation is a number between zero and one. Okay, and the higher the higher the number, the more similar the vector variables. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The matrices C, X, X, and these do they depend on the data or they're just those matrices? are um, the autocovariance matrices, yes. Okay. Um all right, so let's just look at a, a sampling of the results. Um, so I'm just going to show you two sets of results um, to, just to give you a flavor of the sorts of things we're seeing. Um, the first is the similarity between the representation at a given layer and the representation um, at the output of the convolutional layers. So the convolutional layers are computing some sort of local feature vectors, and then those are passed through a bunch of transformer layers that are hopefully learning something more contextual, more distributed. Um, so if we, um, if we look at the um, similarity, the CCA similarity between that output layer of the CNNs 
and each of the transformer layers. We get a bunch of curves that look like this for a bunch of different self-supervised models. Um, so we talked a little bit about uh, wave to vec 2 and Hubert. Wave LM looks pretty similar to that. Um, and these models are actually trained on audio-visual data. Um, I won't say too much about that other than to say that the intuition is that um, we want the speech representation to be similar in some sense to the video representation uh, or the image representation, depending on the data set that it's trained on. Um, you can ask me more if you'd like to know more, but um, I'll move on. Um, and then we also look at um, a randomly, uh, at a model with random parameters, um, just to make sure that what we're seeing is not just some inductive bias of the model architecture. Um, okay, so what do we see here? Um, the models sort of divide themselves into two groups. The random model just kind of slowly forgets its input, so nothing interesting there. Um, and then the real models divide themselves into two classes. Um, one is the audio-only models, um, and the other is the multimodal models. And the audio-only models all have this property that they're doing some masking, and then they're trying to reconstruct in some sense what they've masked. Um, and the multimodal models are trying to relate the two modalities. Um, and what you see is that all of the audio-only models have this autoencoder-like behavior where the representations are getting increasingly far away from the input, and then they're starting to get more similar to the input again as we get to the higher layers. Okay. Which if you think about what the model is doing, it's trying to reconstruct some masked portion of the signal, um, it kind of makes sense that the output layers would start to again look like the input, um, whereas the audiovisual models aren't trying to do anything like that. Okay. Yes. Uh, what's the local feature that you take for the audiovisual model? It's the output of the last CNN layer, so it's the input to the transformer. But of the audio or the the audio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. This is all on the audio. Questions? Okay. Um, let's look at one other set of results, which is um, uh, how similar are the representations to words? And the way that we measure that is we take word level uh, pooled representations. Um, and compare them to one hot vectors corresponding to the word label. Okay. Um, and again, we end up looking at a CCA similarity as a function of the um, transformer layer number for all of the same models. Um, and here, what you can see is all of the models, all of the representations start to be more and more similar to words as we get deeper and deeper into the model, and then less so um, after some intermediate layer. So each of the models has some peak in word knowledge as represented by this, this measure. Um, and depending on the pretext task, it might be a higher layer or a lower layer. I won't get into sort of why we think that, that the peak might occur in different places. Is there a question? Um, so, CCA similarity is like higher, better, like more correlated? Higher is more similar, yeah, more correlated. And it goes up to one? Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions? Yes. Why the, is there a reason why the audiovisual model is not uh, same behavior, a bit less picky. I don't know if the 24th layer is uh, uh, yeah. going down also, or if it's uh, keeping constant for. So these are all the small models. It only goes up to 12 layers. Um, and but yeah, for Av Hubert, the peak is kind of very close to the final layer. Um, well, the same for the peak one. Uh, the same for for the large model. I don't remember. I, don't remember. That's fine. I feel like it was a similar pattern where the audio-visual models tended to retain more linguistic information in higher layers than the audio-only models. Does that matter?
such a recollection. Was that? Not fast BGS. Oh, not fast BGS plus because that one is so heavily based on wave to vec two. Yeah. Yes. You know if there's any correlation between when this peak occurs and the accuracy of the model? So we're going to look in just a second at the relationship between this um, and, and model performance, but we won't. Uh, we probably won't see enough results to actually answer that question. But there is a correlation. Um, so do these analyses tell us something about downstream performance? Um, so we look at a whole bunch of plots like this, and I'm just going to show you one of them. Um, where we look at um, how well correlated is the measure that we're using, in this case, CCA similarity between words and representations, and some downstream task that we care about, in this case, uh, uh, speech sentence um, intent classification type task. But this is a, a CCA word correlation at what level? At the last level? At the last layer? So layer, each dot layer? corresponds to a layer. Um, with these little numbers telling you which layer is which. But we're only looking at accuracy as if, if I truncate in that layer then? I mean, what's the y-axis? What's the y-axis Correct. So I'm truncating at that layer, and I'm learning a model that just applies a linear But it is you train the layers and then just ignore the top layers right. yeah, for right. your That's predictions. Right. That's right. That's right. Um, not all tasks have such a nice correlation. <laughs> Um, but it's not unusual. On average, the correlation is 0.9 between uh, CCA word and speech recognition or spoken language understanding tasks. Um, okay, so I think I've said everything that I wanted to say about this. Uh, it correlates well with speech recognition and with spoken language understanding. Um, as you re you might recall that, yes, I'm, I'm a little confused with something. But, but then does this suggest that you're better off actually predict your know, Throwing away the top layers and very good question. Um, let's ask that question. Um, Wait, that doesn't make sense. Why not? Those top layers are terrible. Why not throw them away? <laughs> why trade it? Okay, let's go back. Okay, um, but but just in case anybody was wondering um, about those layer weights that we talked about before, so um, when I was introducing the superb leaderboard. Um, I mentioned that the way we learn uh, predictors for the superb tasks is to learn a linear combination of the layers of a pre-trained model. You might wonder whether those layer weights are already telling us the same information, and the answer is not quite. Um, and there's good reason for that. Um, you, you might remember from your machine learn introductory machine learning classes that if you just look at the uh, coefficients in a regression model that's not necessarily a good indicator of feature importance and that's exactly what's happening here those layer weights are not a good indicator of feature importance they're somewhat well correlated with performance um, but the um, our analysis our analysis measures are much better okay I have a feeling that we're gonna have trouble getting to the second part of the talk yeah, yeah, so that's okay um, so Nadi asked um, do we need all layers for downstream tasks? So I prepared a slide just for him. Um, Thank you. So we noticed that the higher layers of many of these models often contain less linguistic information. So one question is, can we just remove them? Um, and so we looked at, um, for a, a whole bunch of tasks and a whole bunch of models, um, the performance of using just the best single layer, which is labeled here by its layer number. These are all transformer layers, so they're labeled T something versus learning this linear combination of all layers. Um, and most of the time, we do approximately just as well by using just the best single layer and discarding the remaining layers um, as we do by using all layers. Occasionally, we even do a little bit better, presumably because we just didn't learn a very good set of layer weights and, and predictors on top of those uh, linear combinations. Some, I don't understand how it can how can the best single layer be better like by more than like this much like in some cases um, it's not better by a whole lot well it's, it is in some it's cases. just an optimization I mean not just optimization but right we just learn a bad predictor for some of these tasks given and this is typically quite limited um, training data um, so sometimes we're better off just parameters. 
Um, OK. Um, so that's nice, because we can actually save a little bit of model size, at least as compared to um, using the, fro the full frozen model. Are those numbers, sorry, are those numbers the layer, layer number you used? Yep. OK. So a few final thoughts, and then I'll say, I'll say some. Wait, sorry, since that was a slide for me, I will ask that. Yes, go ahead. But here, I mean, if you ended up using layer 7, and you trained like 12 or 24, I don't know. Well, yeah. Well, just eight, well you're right. 18. Some of these are large models. Whatever, like yeah, some yeah. number that's much, it's significantly yeah, bigger than seven. Yeah, this is a seven. small model, so it's seven out of twelve. Okay, then. Then if, why did you bother training? Yeah, and would it be if you did? If you didn't, I mean, the, the training dynamics would still be different if you train the top or not. I'm curious if you train a seven layer, a seven layer model, and use the seventh layer compared to training a twelve or twenty four or whatever depth of that model, and then using the seventh layer. So that's a good question. We have not trained self-supervised models of different sizes to do that experiment. But my guess is what would happen is there would be some penultimate layer, maybe not exactly penultimate, whatever, some, some intermediate layer that's not the top layer that would still be better for the task because in the end, the pretext task is just not that related to the downstream task. I see. So it's, you're saying it's important to have those top layers for the, because of the way you're doing the, the, the training. OK, nice. OK. All right, so just a few final thoughts about this part. Um, so I think it's safe to say that we're starting to understand something about what's inside these self-supervised models. Um, we haven't talked about this a whole lot because I didn't want to get into the details of the pretext task, but we believe that, um, that we can tell from these results that the layer-specific information depends um, on the pretext task and to some extent how it depends on the pretext task. So we're starting to get some ideas for maybe um, how to design pretext tasks, though we haven't gone that route yet. Um, there's usually some intermediate layers that contain the deepest linguistic information in any uh, self-supervised model. Um, and these, um, if you've seen previous work on analyzing text models, these results won't look super uh, surprising because the same types of results have also been found for language models, um, where the deepest information is sometimes not in the final layer. A uh, quick question. Yes. Well, why is uh, only uh, have to, like why is this an analyzer only happen to self supervised? Can you just apply that to the uh, whisper uh, model, which is self supervised? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can do the same analysis with any model. Um, I, I, what I expect that would happen is that for a model like whisper that's trained for a particular task you would see information that's task relevant in the higher layers, right? Whereas here, we were pre-training with a different task than the one that we eventually care about. Okay. Yes? Uh, find like the best layer, the enemy with how to frame the layers. Does that really give us any computational efficiency? Right, so our analysis is only useful if it actually helps us find that best layer. Um, and so the best layer is not always the one that has the absolute best similarity, um, but it's often close to it. So at, at least you can search among you know, a few layers rather than one. OK. Um, and we think that this better understanding is starting to help us uh, um, use the models better, do better fine tuning. Um, OK. There's a lot more to do and a lot more that I haven't shown you. Um, we haven't studied where non-linguistic information is encoded, though some other people have started doing that. Um, it's interesting to think about um, whether and how this implies that we might be able to make self-supervised learning more semantic. Um, should we bother doing that or should we just learn new text-like models on top of these, these self-supervised models directly, which is a direction that some are looking at. I, won't, I don't want to go into all of that right now. I want to save a little bit of time for the second part. Uh, for more information or to try uh, these analyses out on your favorite model, um, you can refer to Akito's code or the Okay, yes. It's a naive question, but like how do you envision fine tuning? Uh, so the question being like if you have a big enough model and then you fine tune the entire model uh, on the new task, a bigger model like Empirically is known to like, perform better. I don't know why, but that's true. 
rather than if you don't want to fine tune the entire model, then I think the analysis probably makes sense that okay, you won't change the weight, so particular layer is the best thing to go on. Like, so yeah, so I guess there's two answers to that. One is sometimes we just don't want to fine tune the whole model, and then we'd like a little bit of analysis to guide us as to how to fine tune it. And and second is even if we do fine tune the whole model, one thing that we found is that because these final layers are kind of less informative for the task that we care about, we're actually better off forgetting the parameters that we've learned for those final layers, reinitializing, and then fine tuning. Um, and so it guides us to kind of figuring out what we might want to reinitialize rather than. Okay. All right, let's say a few words about sign language. Oh, um, eight minutes. Eight minutes worth of words, okay. Um, so, so, so this is a project that's actually been going on for quite some time, um, usually with one student at TTI and often one student um, in linguistics at the university. This is a collaboration that's been going on with Greg and with Diane Brentari at the university. Um, and most of what I'll be talking about here has been led um, by uh, my student Bowen who should be handing in his thesis any second now um, <laughs> while being a full-time researcher at Meta. Um, okay. Um, but I'm only gonna talk about this at a super high level, but feel free to ask me for details. Okay, so a little bit more background about sign languages. Um, so sign languages are languages that express meaning through gestures of the hands, arms, mouth, and eyebrows, um, to some extent the torso as well. Um, there are more than 70 million deaf people in the world, we believe, um, and depending on how you count, possibly more than 300 sign language sign languages used by them. Um, sign languages have, they're completely distinct from spoken languages, they have their own vocabulary, their own syntax, that's separate from the spoken language that is spoken in the same location, um, because they often developed independently of them, and they don't have a written form. Okay. Um, so as we know, spoken and written languages, language technologies are now ubiquitous. We all talk to our speakers and, and use ChatGPT and all of these things, translate language, search using language, but none of these things are available for sign languages. Um, and of course, we'd like to change that. Um, there are some technical challenges that also make it very interesting to study sign languages. Um, they're visually challenging, so if you wanted to think of, think of it as a computer vision task, you'd have a hard time solving it with off-the-shelf computer vision models because there's a lot of quick motions involved, there's co-articulation between different gestures, um, there's a lot of variability between signers, and because there's no standard written form, there isn't really a sense in which we can transcribe um, sign language, at least not into a standard written form. Um, so, so converting sign language into text that we're familiar with is a translation problem, not a um, and of course, another problem is that there's just very little labeled data uh, for, for any uh, sign language. Okay, um, and like I said, you might start by thinking of sign language technology as a, a computer vision problem, and that's indeed how it's been treated for, for most of the last few decades. Um, but I think the NLP community is starting to look at sign language more seriously, and in fact, at ACL, 2021, there was, a best, there was a best paper award for a position paper about including sign languages in natural language processing. And there was this nice um, graph that they showed of number of computer vision papers about sign language over time versus number of NLP papers about sign language over time. And their goal was to change that. Um, so, uh, so we're part of that wave as well. Um, so over time, sign language research has sort of evolved from very, very simple um, tasks with limited vocabularies in studio settings and small number of signers. Um, these are data sets and tasks ranked by, uh, ordered by year in which they came out. Um, and, and slowly the field has moved on from that to more kind of varied types of settings. So these are um, you know, interpreted uh, uh, news broadcasts and so on, recent uh, research. Um, and we've contributed a couple of data sets as well. Um, one, uh, two data sets in 2018, 2019, and one um, just now at the end of 2022 
Um, and our goal here is um, to work on data that's as natural, naturalistic as possible. So you'll see that our data sets are, um, are, are in much more realistic scenarios, and I'll, I'll have more to say about that. Um, okay, let me skip uh, most of this. <laughs> So I, four minutes, four minutes. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention that there's a number of dimensions of variation of sign language. Um, and our goal um, is sign language understanding that is as natural as possible, open domain, open vocabulary, robust to all sorts of visual variability, sign or independent. For now, we're only focusing on American sign language, but presumably the same technique should be applicable to other sign languages. Um, and we're interested in all of those technical challenges that I mentioned, settings where pose trackers fail, hand detectors fail, and so on. Um, and we're also, in order to deal with sign language in open domains, we need to handle a part of sign language called finger spelling. So let me spend a minute telling you about finger spelling. Um, so finger spelling is a part of sign language um, where loan words from a spoken language are signed letter by letter. Um, so most words in a sign language will have their own sign in that sign language. But a pretty large number will be things like names or um, new technical terms that happen not to have a name in that particular sign language. And then those will end up being finger spelled. Um, and in American Sign Language, this is done with a single hand. So you can see when he switches to finger spelling is when the right hand goes up. And that's, that's an example of finger spelling. And he just goes through a sequence of poses from this uh, alphabet. OK. Um, and depending on how you count, 12 to 35% of ASL uh, corresponds to finger spelling. Two minutes, thank you. Um, and like I said, it's used for important content. Um, so we, we really care about it. Um, so we've, um, the first couple of data sets that we put out were finger spelling data sets. We call them Chicago finger spelling in the wild. Um, they were annotated. One was annotated in house, and one was annotated via crowdsourcing. We were pleased that we were able to find enough sign language users on Amazon Mechanical Turk to do crowdsource annotation of this data. Um, it's it's larger and more diverse than previous data sets. Um, and let me just tell you what we can do with. Um, those are failures of computer vision on sign language. This is a model. You get that, right? OK, let's move on. Um, and um, just to show you kind of the progress that we've made over the last few years, um, we started out with um, finger spelling accuracies that were around here. And over the years, we've developed ways of zooming in on the hand, uh, using mouthing that um, helps indicate um, the finger spelling um, as well, um, incorporated our crowdsource data. And in the end, by the time that Bowen graduated, we ended up with an accuracy that was fairly close to the average accuracy of several humans that we tested on this data set. Um, so we're ple pretty pleased with progress on this task. Um, here are a couple of examples of our finger spelling recognizer in action. This is, of course, the output of the recognizer. Um, and here's a combination finger spelling detector and recognizer. So this is a new story in American Sign Language. And the model is detecting in the red boxes when finger spelling is happening and then transcribing them. Uh, what's the mouthing? Ah, yes. So people will often use mouthing to help, uh, I don't know if it's intended to help the, the viewer or just kind of something that naturally happens while you're finger spelling. You'll often mouth a part of the word that you're finger spelling. Mouthing is also used in other aspects of sign language, but in finger spelling it's often a part of the but word. But is that standard? Like it's, it's, not, it's not standardized. Yeah. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. And I'm out of time. Um, final, final sentence, we've also. Um, also been more recently working on sign language translation, but that totally doesn't work. Um, so we've put out a new data set that we're very excited about, um, but it needs a lot of work to, um, to get anything that works. So if you're familiar with blue scores, 
our best blue score, our best blue four scores are still less than ten. Um, which, you know, for machine translation on, on written languages, it's closer to something like 30. So translate from one sign language to another, to translate from one language to another. This is from, a from American Sign Language to English, to English text. But you don't do from one sign to another sign. We have not done that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I've said most of this stuff, and Nadi is is signaling that I need to stop, so I will stop. Uh, thank you for, for all the good questions. There are lots of excellent questions throughout. We do have uh, maybe time for one or two quick questions, uh, or one, not, one less quick question or two quick questions. Okay, I'll quickly ask something. So what are, I mean, what are the actual applications here? So we mentioned like things like uh, ChatGPT and stuff like that, but those actually interface us through typing. I mean, uh, deaf people can use it just as well. Well, you know, I, I envision can. a future where we speak and sign to something like ChatGPT. So you think that for, uh, that it, do you think it'll be easier for, uh, do you think it's easier for, for uh, yeah. people who, for, for the people to sign in front of a camera as opposed to... It depends on the person, but sure. Um, so for many deaf people, the sign language is their native language, and they can write, they may be able to write in English, but they've learned that as a second language after learning. So last question. Uh, what's the state of that, or how easy is it to maybe go in the other direction and produce a video or animation in sign language, maybe even beyond finger spelling. Yeah, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of work on that. Um, I don't quite know what the state of the art is, but it's it's not awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but Nadi, just to add to my answer to your question, I think the most practical immediate application is just translation itself. So a deaf person should be able to use Google Translate where they input sign language and it outputs the I, language I, that they want in some language, in some, you know, place that they're traveling in, just like you would do when you're traveling. I'm curious, how many people have conversed with a deaf person with this, using a sign language interpreter? What do you mean a sign language interpreter? If you go, like, there are workshops, right, for example, about sign language, where there are large contingent no, you mean of human, deaf human interpreter. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so, I don't know, a few of us have. It is a fairly clunky process. Uh, in all kinds of ways. So I think one of the And the fact that, it, that if these interpreters are needed yes. um, tells you that technology, that, that they're not preferring to write. Okay, uh, sure. I'll well, take yeah. one more question there. But where is more, uh, most of the data come from for the sign language? Uh, YouTube. YouTube. Because uh, I think uh, in some countries, at least Europe, is all of the parliament sessions are trans um, not translated like yeah translated uh, yes on yes yeah uh, yes so a lot of the european sign language data sets um and there are some big ones coming out now are interpreted uh sign language um i don't know if if parliamentary proceedings are included but certainly TV broadcasts and so on. But it's a little bit of a different domain because it's interpreted sign language. Um, and so the sign language, which is a translation from a spoken language, is not going to be exactly the same distribution that somebody signing spontaneously would use. So, I mean, I think there's value to both um, types of data, um, but we're focusing on sort of naturally produced, non-interpreted sign. Okay, uh, we'll end here. Uh, thanks, uh, Karen, again. Uh, last uh, talk of the quarter. Enjoy your uh, spring break, and we'll be back uh, in three weeks, uh, first week of the full quarter with uh, Aaron Petitjen, uh, who's affiliated faculty here. We'll be speaking to us there, and we'll make you here today. Okay, thank you.